Hello and welcome to this week's lecture. This week we're going to talk about multicultural books, which is a an interest of mine and of my research and I think is very important. I'm putting it at this point in the the schedule of weeks because they want it to influence what you choose to read over the next over the course of the semester. So some definitions of multicultural is where we'll start out. The most basic definition books by and about people of color. Uh, we're going to look at the um, CCBC and some of the records that they keep and this is one of their criteria that they use very simply books by and about people of color indicate multicultural books. There are more in-depth definitions. For example, this one by Eliza Dressang, uh, which includes a wider range of diversity, including gender, sexual orientation, differing abilities, and any culture that lacks power or authority in a society. So any culture that's marginalized would be included um, in talking about multicultural books and talking about trying to get representation in your library of a wider range of books about a wider range of individuals. Rudine Sims Bishop, who was the person who first came up with the phrase windows and books, or first began to use that phrase in research, in, in other words, books able to be able to be windows into a different world. For example, if you are um, not of a marginalized culture by reading about them, hopefully if it's a well done book, you can learn something about them. And then books that are mirrors, books where people who are not in um, the the dominant culture can see themselves. So if if you are white, there's a good chance that a lot of the books you're going to open are going to show a person similar to you in, a, in the book. However, if you're black or um, other marginalized ethnicity or gender or sexual orientation or even differing abilities, uh, you're not going to see yourself as often. You're not going to get that mirror where you see yourself in your book, in a book or in other material. And that becomes very important for individuals to be able to re relate to those characters in the books and to be able to, to see them in, in doing things so that they can imagine themselves doing them. We'll talk about that a little bit more when I talk about nonfiction uh, in, in this section. She's also introduced the concept of sliding doors where being we're having Rudine Sims Bishop, we're having material that um, provides both doors and mirrors, windows and mirrors, also provides a, a way to bridge those gaps and, and have people go through doors to participate and understand other cultures. So Bishop's definition was works that reflect the racial, ethnic, and social diversity that is characteristic of our pluralistic society and of the world. Uh, Charles Temple et al. called multicultural literature that literature that reflects the multitude of cultural groups within the United States. And as we know, there's quite a few different cultural groups uh, within the United States. And finally, Galnick and Chin suggest that a truly multicultural approach reflects diversity in a number of microcultures. And they propose that ethnicity, socioeconomic level, religion, language, gender, disabilities, or exceptionalities, so whether you're learning disabled or gifted, and age are most critical to an understanding of pluralism. So these are all different things to think about when you're thinking about acquiring books for and using books with students that you make sure that you're aware of the diversity of characters within the books and the diversity and authenticity of representation within books. Um, so some people have written, as I as I mentioned, Windows and Mirrors by Rudy and Sims Bishop, um, and uh, I did not write page 488, where is that from? But if selected writers represent only one racial ethnic group, only one gender, only one social class, then the cultural plurality is superficial. It's not represented within the books. It's not um, supported by what's seen within media, which we know the 
large effect that media can have on all of us, what we're watching and what we're reading and what we're seeing, if it only reflects one way of being, then it excludes other other people um, just by the fact that it's, it's disappearing them, it's not allowing them to be seen. Uh, culturally relevant literature allows teens to establish personal connections with characters, increasing the likelihood that reading will become an appealing activity. We talked a little bit about the joy of reading and how um, you know that can wax and wane with with students. Some of you have you know, represented that over your own history of reading. But certainly, if we want to keep all students reading, we need to provide literature that reflects all of our students and that also reflects other cultures so they can broaden their horizons. Um, another thing that multicultural literature does is add perspectives of dominated cultures that's missing from textbooks and standards accounts. Often there are additional stories if we think about the history of women in history and how often their story has been overlooked and if you think about textbooks and the founding fathers and kind of ignoring what role women may have played in that from everything to science and um, cooking and um, history all different ways um, if we add as we've begun to do add stories to the classroom and to our libraries about biographies about important women or biographies about women in general we're, we're adding something that's often missing from textbooks and standard accounts and the same can be said of um, history of marginalized cultures Native Americans are not given their due in often uh, in detail and um, properly credited for what their history is and other people are missing their histories and accounts of the history um, in regular textbooks that give a really wide angle view and are written from the dominant culture's uh, perspective. Um, so one of the things about being culturally competent is understanding that culture is a lens through which we view the world. So we have a particular way of thinking that's been developed by what has been around us from the start. And culture doesn't determine ability. We can't say that because you come out of a particular culture, your ability is limited or ex exceeds normal abilities, but it shapes how it's processed and expressed. So you may see people from other cultures not expressing themselves the way that you might be used to, but that doesn't mean that they don't have the ability to, it's just they're expressing it in the way their culture taught them to express it. So the, the, the basic understanding is that students don't enter schools as empty vessels. We can expose them to a lot, but they bring a cultural uh, sensitivity and understanding uh, that come from their home life and from their how they've been raised that shapes how they view the world and we need to consider that when thinking about expanding that cultural competency and also understand understanding their cultural competency so these are some interesting statistics this is the um, children's cooperative book center uh, and they in 1985 began tracking the number of books by black authors and illustrators that was the uh, first first statistics they began tracking you'll see they tracked other things as they went on but it was in partly in response to wondering how many books were actually eligible for the Coretta Scott King book award and this is they they receive quite a bit this particular center receives a, a good portion of all the books issued there's between 3,000 and 5,000 books uh, issued in a particular each particular year children's and, and young adult literature and so they were able to develop a, a keep track by looking every every year what percentage were by black authors and illustrators and you can see that these percentages are pretty woeful it gets up to a high of 2.1 percent of all books children's books uh, published in 1992 were by black authors and or, and or illustrators 
Um, they, and from 94 to 2001, they expanded because they started tracking um, whether it was by or about, and by or about uh, African Americans, by and about, um, they separated out uh, African Americans by and about. So this means it featured people of color, and this means it was written by people of color. Um, African Americans. Then they combined by and about Asian Pacific Americans, American Indians, and Latinos. And you can see none of these statistics. There were more, the, big, the biggest was in 97, 4.5% of all books published in children's literature were about African Americans. Only less than 2% of them were written by African Americans. And we'll talk a little bit about why that becomes important in a few minutes. And here, uh, I haven't updated this since 2011, but I'm going to show you a little bit uh, a different, um, show you the, a later percentage differently. You can see that the numbers, they broke everything out by and about, by and about um, for each category from 2002 to, to current, they continue to do this. And um, you can see that none of the numbers are particularly. What always surprises me is because we are such a large Hispanic and Latino population in the United States, how few books are by or about uh, Latinos. So Sarah Park Dalen had worked with an artist to um, take their statistics in 2015 here you see Sarah Park, and it's illustration by David, I don't know how to say his name, um, Sarah Park Dalen and Molly Beth Griffin, and they took their, um, the Cooperative Children's Book Center statistics for 2015 and put them into this graphic, and you can see 9%, um, 0.9%, less than 1% about American Indians or First Nations, 2.4 Latinx, Latina, and Latino, uh, Asian Pacific and Asian Pacific Americans, African and African Americans are very low. There are more books written with that depict animals and trucks as main characters than there are uh, African Americans, which is kind of interesting. Or even if you combine African American, Asian Pacific, and first, this is 10.9. This is 11. If you combine these three, you get still more animals and trucks. And 73.3% white. Um, so in uh, the asterisk for this one says about a quarter of the total children's books published in 2015 were picture books, and about half of those depict non-human characters like animals and trucks. So it's uh, an interesting statistic. So in addition to the sheer quantity of books, which is what the Cooperative Children's Book Center looks at, you also we also want to think about the um, quality of those books. And one of the ways to do this um, was is by taking apart and looking at certain characteristics of the books uh, that have been published. So one of the things is if there's illustrations, check the illustrations. Look for stereotypes, tokenism, who's doing what and invisibility. Um, so, you know, stereotypical kind of portray portrayals of Mexican uh, Mexicans, as in this gentleman here. Tokenism, just pr one particular character thrown in there um, to represent a different ethnicity. Who's doing what? Is the um, is the non-dominant person or the non-white person, are they just following or do they get to lead? Um, and invisibility, are there, are there no characters at all? One of the things I always look at with this, it's a little bit of tokenism because we're just, this character appeared later um, in, in the series. But what I always find interesting about him, um, and it could be beca because it was tacked on later in a picture, if you notice, every other one of these characters is touching. even. Um, her hair touches peppermint patties here, so, but this character, who I've forgotten his name, is not touching at all the other characters, which I find maybe coincidence, but I just thought it was very interesting that he is not actually touching any of the other characters. This comes from a link I'll give you um, to, a, it's, it's um, how to detect bias in children's books, but these are some common stereotypes. For example, uh, you often see that if a girl is portrayed uh, as independent, they might be manlike, or um, African-American men are gang members. Um, 
LGBTQ or, or sexual predators. So these are some things American Indians live in teepees, carry bows and arrows, and are half naked in winter. So there's um, all Muslims are Arab. These are really harmful stereotypes that if you see these in a book, then you need to um, make sure that when you use the book that you're counteracting, if you use the book, you're counteracting those stereotypes or you're trying to have other books in your collection that don't subscribe to these stereotypes. Um, invisible, I talked about making people invisible. Families who live in rural areas, blue collar workers, homeless families. How, tell me the last time you saw a picture book about a holy, home, homeless family. Even single mothers and fathers, certainly families with two dads or two moms, transgender adults and children, even people of Arab descent, although I've seen more books now uh, with this, but there's still homeless is homeless families are almost never portrayed and it's still difficult to have uh, families with two dads or two moms when we get to censorship we'll talk about um, and tango makes three uh, which brings that point out check the storyline what are the standards for success um, are they um, you know having a a home with a picket fence in in the suburbs or uh, are they you know are they standards that are kind of stereotype standards of success what's the resolution of problems and the role of women in the resolution of problems this is a a, a graphic that I found on the internet about les, uh, lessons Disney teaches through their comic um, their their animated stories uh, and I think they're pretty funny so um, Cinderella teaches if you're beautiful enough you may be able to escape your terrible living conditions by getting a wealthy man to fall for you um, and I always was bothered too by and I, I'm not saying I don't love these movies and this is just another um, another way these messages these movies talk about could be um, could be interpreted so uh, with the Little Mermaid the little blurb says it's okay to abandon your family, drastically change your body, and give up your strongest talent in order to get your man. Once he sees your pretty face, only a witch's spell could draw his eyes away from you. So these are these subliminal, mes mes subliminal messages, or maybe not even so subliminal, subliminal that these um, movies and books could be um, giving to young girls, which we don't want to give them that message. Um, look at the lifestyles. Negative value ju judgments about a lifestyle that may be different than what you are accustomed to. Inaccurate or inappropriate depictions. This is really important that we get accurate depictions and that um, the authors have done their research and really um, either are from the culture that they're writing about or that they've done enough research that they can represent the culture authentically and properly so that we're not learning um, stereotyped versions of a country um, or a, a culture but that we're actually learning from the inside and also uh, quaint natives and costume which I, this is kind of my stereotypical example um, that you know it's what you might expect to see if you visit El Paso is the uh, serape and sombrero which is certainly not um, a complex rendering of what a, what that culture might be like. And on the other hand, this book Coolies is a gorgeous representation, um, and it not only reflects costumes, not even costumes. Queen, this is a costume. This is actually what they would wear, and it's about um, Coolies is um, about the Chinese immigrants coming over. These are brothers that are depicted on the cover coming over to work on the uh, transatlantic railroad in the late uh, 1800s. And the depictions of their life are gorgeous. The, the illustrations are amazing. But also when you look about the depictions of the relationship between these two, um, their family relationship is depicted beautifully and they watch out for each other and they're, you know, they're truly um, brothers and family and, and you know, work, watch out for each other. So um, that's a family relationship. In other cases, you need to look at who is making the decisions. Is it always the white character that's making the decisions? Do minorities only have supporting roles in the relationship, and are they there mostly just to so that that white person can have a, a friend who's a person of color? Um, 
the other thing with authenticity, if you read about these, the background of the author and the illustrator here, you can see that they have a background that allows them to, um, that are with, within the culture and which allows them to depict relationships and culture and clothing, although in this case it's historical, so they had to do more research, um, but it gives them the, the um, cultural authenticity to, and, and background to, per, to portray these, these individuals. And this is a fiction book about a, a true historical time, but it gives them a, a, the book authenticity. So note the heroes, are they safe heroes? In other words, um, are they heroes who are trying to help? I think of, of Black Life, Lives Matter and how there's it's depicted differently. Um, some people might say that people who are um, supporting Black Lives, Marrow, Black Lives Matter are not safe because they might not they f some people feel like they're protesting against police and it's not it, it wouldn't they wouldn't be considered safe heroes if they were protesting for something like um, if you saw somebody supporting abolition which we've all come to agree is a safe a safe thing then you would consider them to be a safe hero we can talk comfortably about Harriet Tubman who helped people escape from slavery but it might be more difficult for us to be comfortable with somebody, who, a, a character in a book who was uh, promoting Black Lives Matter and who benefits from the hero's, sorry, there's a grammatical mistake there, from a hero's actions. Um, is it the white and black community? Is it just the white community? Or is it, um, is it something that minorities might um, only benefit from and by benefiting improve community overall, but not see a particular benefit um, for the dominant culture. Um, effect on the child's self-image. Often, So often white is equal to beauty and black is equal to evil. It's also issues of body image. I've used um, Augustus Gloop here from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, um, which I think could make somebody who in you know, who was overweight and enjoyed food, not feel good about themselves. Here we've got, uh, I don't you remember, know if all of you, this is kind of an old movie, Lady and the Tramp, and these are twin Siamese cats who sing in a very um, oriental sing-song, we are Siamese, if you please, and they um, are the bad characters in the book. And again, here, in talking about the author or illustrator's background and perspective, what is their experience, their authenticity, their cultural perspective, their personal context? So have they given some indication that they've gone beyond, or that they're either from the culture and have that authenticity because they're from the culture, or have they done enough research and been careful enough to portray it authentically? Um, it's like having somebody kind of come into your family and there's some certain in jokes in your family that somebody from outside takes a while to understand what those in jokes are or to understand shorthand that you use in your family and that's the same with um, somebody coming into another culture there's things that take place in the culture that if you are not of that culture you don't understand and you might not get uh, be able to portray correctly unless you've spent a lot of time in that culture or you've had somebody um, there's an issue of sensitivity readers now where you have somebody from the culture read it to see if something to, to read your manuscript or read a manuscript before it goes out there to see if there's anything egregious that would offend somebody because they've been they're not from within the culture and they're not portraying it correctly also be careful and look for for loaded words and this image to me is the portrays one of those loaded words when it comes to Native Americans and they were often called savage well they weren't savage to themselves they, that was how they were portrayed by people who were coming in to try and steal their land so savage primitive inscrutable wily backwards those can all be loaded words that mean have extra cultural connotations derogatory cultural connotations attached to them. So 
we've talked about stereotypes, tokenism, invisibility, loaded words, relationships, and this is where I got those two boxes from, um, Teaching for Change, which gives us um, a, a more detailed rundown of what I've just given you here, and common harmful, common harmful undermining stereotypes, people who are invisible, and some of the stuff that we talked about talked about here. Um, here's Entango Makes 3, which I'll mention now. Basically, um, even though well, Entango Makes 3 was a story about two male uh, penguins in the Bronx or Brooklyn Zoo, I'm not sure. Bronx Zoo, I guess, who raised, who were nesting together. The zookeeper saw that they were nesting together and they they brought an egg together over and they were nesting with the egg. So the zookeepers had an egg for a penguin who um, was had been abandoned by a, another couple so they uh, brought the, the egg over and had these two male penguins hatch the egg. And so this is a use of um, a, a, Non that this would come under that non um, non human section of the graphic that we saw, although they wouldn't have been counted elsewhere because that graphic doesn't count the number of LGBTQ stories, but it just kind of um, shows how sometimes books use non um, human characters to explore these issues. However, it still didn't work out because it it was uh, it was still got. A lot of flack, which we'll discuss later. So there's some other um, there's some other resources here if you want to do some more reading on your own. Okay, so when you're developing lessons, what has been suggested is to choose high quality texts and move up from the touristic approach of the five F's. So go beyond just food, fashion, fiestas, folklore, and famous people and get into a more a deeper examination of the culture. And I just wanted to, as I'm doing in most of these lectures this, about genre, just point out a couple of books within the genre that could be interesting. I got my slide off kilter here, but this is a great series by um, Rita Williams Garcia. Um, and you can see all of the um, medals on, on on some of these. And uh, this one did, oh yeah, this one, Coretta Scott King, Coretta Scott King. This one also, um, uh, Scott O'Dell Award, New Newbery Honor Award, National Book Award. So this is a, a series of three books about uh, three sisters, Delphine, Vanetta, and Fern Gaither in the 60s, and they live in New York. I think one crazy summer they go out to uh, San Francisco and interact with the Black Panther movement, um, PSB 11, I don't think they go anywhere, and then in Gog Crazy in Alabama, they visit relatives down in Alabama. Wonderfully, mi um, middle grade, wonderfully written books um, that are you know basically about the relationship of three sisters and uh, their family which is relatable to anybody. This one I really like because it's a picture book nonfiction about Bass Reeves who was the first African-American deputy US Marshal when it was still kind of the Wild West. Jingle Dancer, I mentioned Cynthia Ledich Smith last week, and she. this is a lovely book about a Native American custom told from within uh, the Native American community. Cynthia Ledich Smith has roots within the community and uh, tells a lovely story. One of the things that um, Native Americans are often unhappy about in portrayals of themselves is that they're portrayed as not existing anymore. Uh, and this one takes place in the current in current times where they're she's enacting their customs, but it's not some long past and making Native Americans in the in the um, in the present invisible. Another thing that happens and something I'm working on researching is just having um, 
people of color on the on the front of books. This is an unusual book in that it features a non-white person um, in in a, a science and craft books. I, I did a um, a research project where I looked at uh, all of the books that were issued. Um, all, all of the nonfiction books that were re reviewed in the first six months of 2015 uh, or 2016, I don't remember, and just looked at the covers of all of the nonfiction books. They're all, all the books reviewed in SLJ in the first six months. And there were two times as many white people depicted on the cover of books as people of color and two times as many males as females, which really kind of... If you think about how that would make people feel and how you might react to not being able to see yourself or somebody who looks, again, a mirror of yourself doing uh, science experiments or being shown as a, um, as a scientist or being shown in any kind of nonfiction setting, uh, biographies and, and actually biographies are one of the areas where you do find more women and more people of color, but just uh, on a on a, any old cover to have yourself to see yourself on the cover would be, have a huge impact on what you think you can do in life in 2015 uh, it just so happened that the Newberry winner and the two honor books were all uh, diverse books because we had uh, Kwame Alexander about uh, an African-American family, and this is a, a book in verse in case you're looking for verse later. Um, El Defo was written by C.C. Bell, who is deaf, and um, it's it's an autobiographical, except for she it, um, uses a bunny instead of herself as the main character, and it's a graphic novel, so it's really um, interesting. And then Brown Girl Dreaming by Jacqueline Woodson. I believe this is also in verse, and um, Jacqueline Woodson is our current National Children's Literature Ambassador, or Natural, nat I forget what exactly her title is, but she's just become the amba uh, Ambassador for Children's Literature. There's a great, um, I think I mentioned it to you last week, but this uh, Disability and Kidlet, they have an honor roll. And these are books that, that, that have been vetted by people with, um, and this is more disabilities than other kinds. So when we talk about multicultural, we're talking about, you know, gender and abilities and um, ethnicities and religions, etc. So these are books that have been reviewed by people with um, the same disabilities for and and shown to be um, that they felt there was an authentic portrayal uh, with this of this literature. <laughs> and once again, I'm going to be excuse me. I'm going to be leaving putting the slide up so that you can click through to all these links. Um, so resources. This is the CCBC Cooperative Children's Book Center and they talk about multicultural literature and also within here they have their um, annual statistics which is where I, some of that material went, came from that I showed you earlier or those uh, charts of tables that I showed you earlier. Oyate does um, reviews of Native American material Lee and Low Books is wonderful for multicultural books. They have a blog um, about multicultural literature and um, also sell books and also have um, contests so that um, people with diverse backgrounds uh, who are looking to write and just all kinds of information. And uh, they had done, um, w along with We Are Diverse Books, here, here again, you're going to see this mirror and window books wherever you look and read about uh, diversity in books. So they have um, lists here, which are great. Ten favorite multicultural books for preschool, first grade, second grade so far. Hundreds of titles. So they're, they're a really good resource, um, even if you don't purchase through their, um, through this book site. They're a good place to go to find additional material.
Cinco Puentes Press is good. Cinco Puentes Press for um, for uh, diverse books. Also very good for diverse books. Um, I think I, I introduced you to this. This is an amazing blog, American Indians and Children's Literature, where Debbie Reese really, really carefully reviews the, the depiction of American Indians in children's literature and how that depiction can harm people. Um, and this is this is a column she did with uh, recommended books. Uh, at, it's from 2013. It's a little old, but it's still um, it gives you uh, some good authors to continue to look for, uh, like Tim Tingle does wonderful stuff, and I really liked this book. Um, Louise Erdrich is Erdrich is very good. Check and Dickie, and where did the book go? Um, so it must be farther down. Yes. Okay. So Gansworth, if I ever get out of here, that's also very, uh, I really enjoyed that. So um, a, that's a good list of books. We need diverse books we looked at last week. And there's a lot of really good information on their blog site um, that you can take a look at. Sarah Park Dal Dalin, who I um, showed you the, um, just the graphic that she helped develop. She also um, has a great book. This is part of her syllabus, Library Materials for Young Adults, and she has a great list of books that she's having them read. Um, there's two different ways you can do literature courses, and some people assign a bunch of books to read. I, I don't do that, but I think this is a really good list. And then awards. You have the Carter G. Woodson Book Award, which is for distinguished books appropriate for young readers that depict ethnicity in the United States. And that's from the National Council for Social Studies. So, I don't know. They have some really good, some, some really good books. They're more focused on um, certainly history and social studies. Um, Margaret Batchelder, I think I mentioned this award last week, which is the um, translated, published in another language other than English and translated into English for publication. And you can really, I think it's so interesting to um, see what was written, um, j just what they focus on. You, you're kind of learning about the other uh, culture just by virtue of the fact that it was written in that culture for that culture. Asian Pacific American Librarians Awards. This is one of the awards that's now going to be um, announced with the Newberry Caldecott, etc. And they have adult, young adult children's picture book, the American Indian Youth Literature Award, again speaks for itself. This was a really good story, How It Became a Ghost. I really enjoyed that. And the Sydney Taylor Book Award, which is um, uh, the Jewish Library Association. And uh, this is from 2017. And they also list, they don't have pictures, which I think is a shame. But um, OK, so, so uh, multicultural books are so important for your collection, even if you have, or maybe even especially if you have an all-white population, um, it, it, it becomes important for them to learn about people that they don't interact with on a daily basis through books. And certainly, it's extremely important if you have a mixed population in your school or your population that you work with as um, to help read, learn to read, or in your classroom. It's really important to have a variety of books and have a variety of high quality multicultural nonfiction. Just because there's a book with uh, one uh, person of color in the book somewhere it doesn't automatically say, oh, I have a diverse book now. So uh, it, it's, it's a really more and more important, especially as our schools, I think the, the statistic I've read is I think we've already reached the point when more than 50% of the students in our schools are non-white. Uh, so the, the, the population of most schools is 
needs needs these books um, because to see themselves in mirrors. But we all need these books to open ourselves to learning new material. And that's the end of the lecture. I'll see you on the discussion board.